Uh, welcome, Jose, to this interview series showcasing HKIC's leadership. Thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is give a brief overview of your career and then uh, talk a bit about uh, your role at HKIC and your view of Hong Kong in, a, in several different ways. So, so you're, a, you're a graduate of Oxford uh, and you were admitted to the Hong Kong bar back in 2000. So you've been practicing now for 20 years, um, despite your youthful appearance. Yes. Um, and over that time, you've specialized in corporate disputes, uh, commercial disputes, banking and financial services disputes, as well as insolvency disputes. And in the banking and financial services disputes, you've acted for the uh, SFC, as well as the um, listing commission of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And you've also appeared before the uh, listing uh, listing commission, listing appeals commission, as well as the takeover and mergers panels. Um, you have also specialized, of course, in arbitration. You took silk in 2016. You became a senior counsel in uh, in Hong Kong, and you've also had some other leading roles uh, in Hong Kong in the le legal community. For example, you were the vice chairperson at the Hong Kong Bar Association for 2017 to 2019. You've been a contributing editor to the White Book, which is the commentary on the Hong Kong on Hong Kong civil procedure for 15 years from 2003 to 2018. Um, you have served as a deputy judge in the district court and in the high court. And one thing I should also mention uh, is that this year you were admitted to the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court of the British Virgin Islands. And uh, that's interesting. We see a lot of work coming out of the BVI on our cases, and we'll come on to that a little bit more later. Um, in terms of HKIAC, you uh, were uh, a member of the HK45 in 2016 to 2018, and that's the younger branch of um, HKIAC. And then uh, you served on the appointments committee of HKIAC from 2017 to earlier this year. And you've been on HKIC's council, our governing board, uh, since October 2018. So we've been keeping you pretty busy. Yeah. Um, so, Jose, I wanted to talk to you because, um, you know, you've been a, a, a member of the Hong Kong legal community for many years and you've served in many different roles. How would you describe generally Hong Kong as a legal jurisdiction? Hong Kong, uh, as you know, is obviously the only uh, common law jurisdiction uh, within uh, China and we are a fully sort of paid up member of the common law world in that in fact, in, in, both in terms of standard law and also in terms of procedure, uh, what we do here is very, very close to what happens in England, Wales, in Singapore, in some of the Caribbean jurisdictions, Australia, and, and so on. And this is why a lot of uh, uh, people, the investors, lawyers, who are very comfortable in litigating or having their, their dispute resolved in Hong Kong. Uh, in fact, you can even see from the fact that our system is so uh, uh, closely connected to the others that. Uh, on occasions, we have overseas counsel appearing in the courts in Hong Kong. Uh, we have recently retired, say, uh, high court judges in England who come here and sit from time to time. And I think that if the system were uh, uh, very much different or materially different from the other system, this sort of arrangements uh, would not be, be possible at all. And so I think it's a system uh, which a lot of people understand and feel comfortable with. Yeah. Um, and just moving on from Hong Kong as a legal jurisdiction, Hong Kong is also one of the leading international financial centers in the world. And I know that, you know, you've, you have a lot of connection in respect of banking and financial disputes and some of the major institutions, including the SFC, for example, who, whom you've acted for in your experience um, as a lawyer here in Hong Kong. How do you how do you see Hong Kong as an international financial center? Well, I think uh, geographically and culturally, obviously. Uh, uh, we are in a very advantageous uh, position and also because of the, the, the software. So it's not just uh, rule of law or uh, the independence of judiciary, which is often talked about, but of course there's also the very important uh, regulatory framework and Hong Kong is a very uh, well-regulated market. It's well regarded, uh, both in terms of how, how the SFC and the other regulatory bodies are operating. I think it gives a great deal of confidence uh, to the investors and this is why uh, Hong Kong is such a sort of uh, in a, such a premier position in terms of raising of, of capital uh, uh, um, 
in terms of IPO, for example, I think whether we're first or second, we've consistently ranked very uh, highly in terms of raising uh, capital, largely, but not only for, for mainland Chinese companies. But it's, I, think, I think that speaks to that. Yeah. And, you know, it really uh, resonates in terms of what we see on our cases. We see a lot of uh, corporate as well as banking and financial services disputes come through, and that's a growing area, particularly involving parties from mainland China and cross-border transactions with other parties from all around Asia, but also around the world. Uh, and I know in your arbitration experience, you, you deal with a lot of these types of disputes, and you're on our specialist panel for financial services disputes. But tell me, why do you think that Hong Kong is, is a jurisdiction that is attracting these kinds of disputes, and especially in arbitration? Well, I think, the, the, I think the, the, the disputes which go to arbitration obviously often happen a few years after the relevant transactions or agreements have been entered and therefore reflect the nature of the economic activity of the location. So whereas I think, say, 10, 15 years ago, uh, relatively, a relatively large extension of the disputes concern, say, construction, shipping, commodities trading, as the years went by and as Hong Kong's role sort of uh, transitioned, uh, we've seen far more things like shareholder disputes, uh, pre-IPO agreements, and other uh, disputes which arise from financial transactions. And I think this reflects albeit with a bit of a time lag, is normally disputes happen somewhat later than when you first enter into those agreements. And therefore, I think that the, the trend definitely will be uh, upwards in terms of uh, these types of disputes concerning finance or uh, corporate finance and other um, uh, um, of those types of agreements. Mm. Um, so I want to turn now to your work with HKIAC. We've had the pleasure of having you on board for some years now, first in the appointments committee role, which is very important. Um, and now as uh, continuing as a council member, as part of our governing board. Um, how, have you, um, how have you seen your roles and what has stood out for you during your time working with HKIC? Well, I think I first clarify, I did not leave HK45 because I had reached the, uh, the statutory maximum age, but rather I'd served long enough. Uh, but in terms of the appointments committee, it was quite an eye-opening experience because obviously I, I had previously uh, I've been involved in disputes where either we've appointed an arbitrator or we're waiting for the, the center to appoint an arbitrator. And from the outside, it's not always obvious the amount of uh, time and effort and care uh, which is taken by the appointments committee. And because the appointments committee, as you know, is quite diverse. We have solicitors, we have barristers, we have people from common law background, non-common law background, some who are, in fact, uh, uh, from in-house, as it were. And so different, I, th I thought we, we were really able to, as a as a body to, to come up, I think, with a rather uh, a larger list of names or suitable uh, uh, appointees than I thought of. And I think that, I think that, that reflects into the, the, the quality and the suitability of the appointees. I think over the years, the other thing I think that we've worked on quite hard is to ensure a larger diversity in terms of the appointees. So whereas upon, once upon a time, perhaps, where th there was a tendency, and I think this applies in many, many areas where they are obvious names and the, the comfort zone is obviously to go back to the obvious names. I think we've, uh, the, the centre has done really well in trying to expand uh, in terms of the appointees without in any way diluting the quality or experience. And I think that, that's been recognised uh, in the market. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's very important for, for the future of, of our work. Yeah. Um, so one final question, uh, a bit more of a personal question. You have a unique profile in that you are a, a Hong Kong-born Eurasian, self-described, uh, and you have a range of languages uh, at your fingertips. You speak Cantonese, obviously, English, obviously, as well as uh, French, and you speak some Mandarin. And my question to you is, as a Hong Kong-born Eurasian, I have two questions. As a Hong Kong-born Eurasian, where do you prefer to spend your vacations? And also, what languages do you speak to your children in? The first question is the easy question because I have very little say over where I spend my holidays. The, uh, the, the children normally dictate that and I think that they are keen skiers, much better skiers than I am. So it, it will often uh, uh, gravitate around either Japan, obviously, or, or the Alps. So those were the, the, the sort of more favorite holidays and therefore we, we end up going back again and again either to Japan or Switzerland and Austria for the, uh, the skiing. So. Uh, I have some short trips where I get some uh, input, but not, 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 not the decisive. <laughs> the children cut the decisive vote. In terms of the uh, languages, 
Uh, so, so both kids were, were born here as I was, as so obviously they, they speak uh, English and Chinese. I've tried to maintain a bit of the uh, French cultural heritage and that worked quite well with my daughter who's pretty fluent. So she, we, we will speak in French to one another. I think with my son, as sometimes these things go, he, he can understand most of it, but he certainly would not reply in French beyond a few, a few words, but um, it's not for want of trying. Uh-huh, okay. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> well, uh, Jose, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your work uh, with HKIC. We look forward to continuing working with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.